small island, we don't all have the same strength of signal. And where I am in the city, it's pretty good here, but David is out in the sticks over in England, over the border, maybe maybe some 80 miles from here. And um, I think it's in farmland, so you, you won't have a, a strong signal. I don't know if you have that sort of thing. Um, issues over in the States, I'm sure you do. Alison's saying me to, okay, so Caroline, you're back now, excellent. And you, right, okay, I you so there, Jackie. Right, so he's gone. Um, so <clears throat> I, I think he'll go and try on his phone now. Did he not do this um, recently? What a shame. Is there any other way around it, Robert? Um, so, I mean, the, the most, the, the guaranteed way is not to use Wi-Fi to actually have a cable, but most laptops don't have that now. Is that right? Yeah. Gosh. Could we fit them up with something? Um, you see, I keep my my cables always in my my router. You mean? Yeah. So, so with apologies, um, there was a question asked in the click meeting room. Uh huh. Um, but obviously, we all got kicked out. So. <laughs> um, right. you, have you still got it, or have we got to ask that person to? Whoever asked yes. the person needs to put it back in again. Okay. So. If you wouldn't mind, it'd be grateful. God, that's quite a pass now. Yeah, so all we can do is apologise for this. Um, yeah. But we will get there as soon as we can. Dave is used to doing these, uh, but with us and with a whole lot of other organisations. So if he needs to use his phone, he will do. So Caroline, um, first time watching us, so thank you very much. Welcome. But um, so just to let you know what we do. So today, Thursday, 2 p.m. UK time, uh, we always have a live and interactive question and answers. With us at the moment is Collect Thane MBE, who's our Chief Executive Officer. And about to join us very shortly is Professor Dave Jones, OBE, who is a world eminent PVC and liver specialist. Um, so, Caroline, welcome. If you've not already done so, please do have a look at our website, which is www.pbcfoundation.org.uk. You can register with us for free, and that gives you a whole welcome pack. It gives you access to the magazines. It gives you access to our... Um, self-management app. It gives you access to our compendium, which is an 80-page booklet. So I will show that with you. So that's our 80-page booklet, and you can get that again online. Um, if you want to download the one that's on the website, it's absolutely free. If you want a physical book, you actually do need to pay for it. But that is the only thing that we ever, ever charge for is that. So, um, Chief, if you want to say hi, I'd, I'd love for you to, to take this opportunity. Yeah, no, hello everybody again. I'm, I'm quite curious as to why Caroline Hill would be saying perhaps you could sing some more Gregorian chant, Robert, while we wait. Is this something that's been practised on your four o'clock sessions? Uh -huh, there you go. So no, this was this was the Tuesday 2pm. We looked at sleep hygiene mm -hmm. and we talked about um, using calm and music. Mm -hmm. One of the examples was Gregorian chant, and for those. All oh, right, okay, <laughs> yeah, because I had the CDs. You nicked them from me to tape them. You never gave them back. You were about eighteen at the time, Robert. Um, <laughs> Alison's asking a question here, Alison. What would be helpful to know if you have the AMA antibodies? So uh, David would have a bit more information if, um, to answer that question. Um, if you if you have the A. M A antimicrobial antibody. Are you able to contact David Robert? Right, I'll go mute myself and I'll give him my phone again. Yeah. Okay. Keep the questions coming in, guys, because we will be ready for you. Yeah. As ever, you know, Dave's usually opening to to overrunning, so I'm sure we'll get all your questions answered. Um, someone is typing. It says here. Yeah. Oh, I do apologise about this. You know, we've been doing them every Thursday since the lockdown started last March. And they've been so successful. Here he is again. My God, are they books behind them? Uh, books and DVDs. So, yeah, no, I've, I've literally been hunting, hunting down somewhere in the house. 
David, just very quickly before we start, we were just talking about the situation with your signal. Robert was saying that laptops no longer, um, they're difficult to, to have a cable into your router. It's something yeah. I've had to do. It's maybe something you could think about. We can send you a cable if that would help. Um, I don't think, because I've got a whizzy Bill Gates style laptop, which doesn't have a right, it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a connection for an Ethernet cable, so you, we're reduced to kind of Wi-Fi. Anyway, you've got me now. Okay. You've got me now. Right. I'm going to hand stay over to Robert. He is in charge of the questions coming in. Um, and one of them that's come in is asked by PBC PSC. I've asked if they've got the antibody, if they would let you know before you answer that question, the AMA antibody. Robert, he's muted himself. You've muted. <laughs> Sorry, I've muted myself. <laughs> it's amateur hour here today. What is going on? Don't try this at home. We're trained professionals. Right, let's try again. Okay, now that we're here. So the question in the room, Dave, is to do with biopsy as a diagnostic tool. Yes. So as PBC or even PSC, um, consultants are still unsure as to which disease this lady has. And maybe you could comment on that in general as well, please. Yeah, okay, right. So um, so for 90% of people, no need for biopsy to diagnose PBC, okay? And the reason is there are three tests we use for diagnosis, and you need to have two of them be positive to make a diagnosis and if that's the case that's 95 percent accurate so there is no need for the third and those three are one of the pbc antibodies usually the antimitochondrial antibody but it can be one of the other ones the second is um the the blood biochemistry the alkphos value the alkaline phosphatase and then the third is biopsy. And so as long as you can make two out of the three, that makes a confident diagnosis. And for most people, 90% of people, it's the antibody and the liver blood test. So it's all on the blood tests, okay? Now, the, reason, the situations in which you need a biopsy for diagnosis are where you can't make two points without a biopsy, and that is in people who's, who are antibody negative. So you can't, if you don't have AMA or one of the other antibodies, you can't diagnose PBC without a biopsy, because otherwise all you've got is an abnormal liver biochemical test, which can be caused by gallstones and you know who knows what. So where you don't have the antibody, you need to have a biopsy. But in the UK, that's two to three percent of patients, no more than that. Um, so most people are AMA positive and therefore the diagnosis is easy. This is all for diagnosis. Now, PSC, for those people less familiar with PSC, it's a sort of cousin. It's a sort of cousin of PBC um, in the sense that it causes poor bile flow again. Um, but it isn't quite the same mechanism. So there's more scarring around the bile ducts. It can be the big bile ducts, whereas PBC is only the little bile, duct, bile ducts. So PSC is a whole variety of different forms, one of which kind of looks like PBC and all the way through to ones with the big bile ducts that don't really look like it. The point about PSC is that there are no antibodies that go with it. And so therefore, if you're unwary, you can, um, you can mistake somebody um, with an antibody negative PBC for PSC. Now, there are some additional tests you can do with PSC, but some imaging, so what are called magnetic resonance scans. You can look at the bile ducts like that, and you can do biopsy. So in fact, for PSC, you usually make a positive diagnosis with images, with, with advanced imaging rather than biopsy. But the question always with people and AMA negative PBC is, is it PSC? Now, does it matter if it's a, a PBC or a PSC, given that the process is similar? Well, it does for one important reason. Um, well, two important reasons. The first is the treatments are much more sophisticated for PBC. So, for example, although urso deoxycholic acid is widely used in PSC, we don't use a beta cholic acid, we don't use bezafibrate, and so you narrow the options down. So PBC has more treatment options. 
And the other one is a very, very important one, is that PSC does something that PBC doesn't, which is to give you a slightly increased risk of cancers. And that's really important. So it can give you a slightly increased risk of bowel cancer and a slightly increased risk of bile duct cancer. Now, that is not true of PBC, full stop. So we need to know if somebody's got PSC because we will screen their bowel and we will screen their bile duct. So um, essentially, you have an additional element to the follow-up that you need whilst not sort of treating with a beta -colic acid. If in doubt, if in doubt, then we, we, we leave a question mark and do the additional screening. So there are sometimes we just can't tell because it, it, it ultimately can look very similar on the biopsy. And if in doubt, then you go for a safety first approach. But you do it explaining to people that we don't think you've got PSC, but we can't be certain you haven't. And so rather than be caught out and remember, always remember, think about bowel cancer in particular, it starts as polyps which literally take five minutes to remove in a, in a colonoscopy. It's the easiest condition in the world to treat in its earliest stages. And that's where you, you want to see people. So a colonoscopy, nobody likes the idea. Nobody you know, looks forward to it. But if you've got a polyp that could turn into a cancer, it is a literally, literally life-saving investigation. So if in doubt, treat it as, as PSC. Where we use biopsy, and we'll not talk about it now, is in understanding people whose disease doesn't kind of behave with treatment. So most people who get a biopsy with PBC, it is to understand where to go next with treatment when it hasn't played by the rules, where it's being a little bit complicated. So not to diagnose, but to guide where you go with treatment is where you tend to use it. Yeah. <clears throat> and it, yeah. is it right to say that children have PSC where they don't PBC, is that? Yes, that's right. So children um, can get PSC. Um, so it's an important condition in children. Um, we, we genuinely have never seen PBC um, uh, it, below the age of 18. Um, never seen it. Um, PSC, the other thing just to remember is that um, it gets really complicated in that both PBC and PSC can also overlap with a third condition, which is autoimmune hepatitis. So it does get a little bit complicated. Yeah. Although the one thing you never see is PBC and PSC overlapping. So, um, so there can be an element, and children are much more likely to have these slightly more complicated conditions. But that does that does simplify it. Okay. Um, so, uh, I the, the the just to pick up on the chat. The, the, the comment is, I think I was negative for AMA, but not sure if the following is of any use. Anti-smooth muscle antibody positive, anti-nuclear factor, plus, 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 alkaline phosphatase, 450. So those are the tests you need to see. Um, and so the answer is very useful. So what does an alkaline phosphatase of 450 mean? Well, that's significantly positive. So that's a real elevated alkaline phosphatase. So there is something there is something going on. It could be PSC, it could be PBC, it could be something else, but there is something going on. So you need a diagnosis because you need to look to treat that. So that's definitely positive. If you're anti-mitochondrial um, antibody negative, you're anti-mitochondrial antibody negative. And about 5% to 7% of UK PBC patients are negative. So it definitely exists. Most people who are anti-mitochondrial antibody positive, uh, sorry, negative, are positive for a particular type of anti-nuclear antibody. Now, I do apologize. I, I spent the first 10 years of my career micro-dissecting these antibody regimes. And so I'm a bit of an antibody geek. So I do apologize for this. It does get complicated. But you can tell a phenomenal amount from them. So most people with an anti-nuclear antibody that's positive have a particular type, which is a very sort of diffuse staining one. That's the one you get with lupus. That's the one you get with autoimmune hepatitis. We sometimes see it with fatty liver disease these days. So that's the common type. And that is not what you get with PBC. With PBC, you get a particular type with a different staining pattern. It's dots in the nucleus. It's a rim around the nucleus. So it's, as I said, it's a bit geeky, but it's a really important distinction. So 
where people have features that make you think of pbc an alphos of 450 where features that make you think of an autoimmune liver disease that's what smooth muscle antibody does it doesn't tell you which one but it tells you it's probably not a completely independent condition it's something autoimmune so you're into is it aih pbc or psc the anti-nuclear factor anti-nuclear antibody is positive the $64 million question is, is it diffuse staining, in which case it is um, an AIH overlap type of condition, or is it diffuse, um, is it nuclear dot staining or rim staining, in which case it means the same as AMA? So the question always when people who, who you're thinking about PBC have got uh, an anti-nuclear antibody is what is the pattern of staining? And you should go and ask your doctor, what is the pattern of staining? And they will either go, oh, it's diffuse staining, or they'll shuffle their papers and go, uh, I'm not sure. But what they need to do is to ask their lab what the pattern of staining is, because if it's that PBC pattern, it is the equivalent of AMA and makes the diagnosis. Putting that, I'll tell you what I would put my money on, seeing that combination, that's PBC, okay? That will be the PBC anti-nuclear antibody because we see this is the pattern we do see. Um, and I think for all intents and purposes, it's therefore PBC. But it is a diffuse staining, then it's a bit of a mixed picture. And it's, um, I hate to say it, probably one of those situations where a biopsy could be useful because mm -hmm. is it autoimmune hepatitis overlapping with a PSC? Is it a PBC? If it's PBC, is it, does it have any autoimmune hepatitis elements? It's the sort of place where a biopsy might be useful. But the number one question is, um, is what's the staining pattern? And then the other useful thing is there's a, a, a test that we do called the IgM, which is the part of the antibody fraction. And a lot of people will have, on the call have had their IgM measured. Um, it's elevated in PBC, okay? Nobody knows why. Nobody knows what it means. It doesn't cause any harm. It's just high. But importantly, um, there are only two conditions in the world that give you a high IgM. One of them is PBC, and the other is Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, macroglobulinemia. And I'm telling you now, I've never seen anybody with Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. So it's PBC. So although it's a funny one, it's not part of the normal diagnostic test, but we do it in these situations as a tiebreaker. So if you've got that collection of antibodies and your IgM is high, it's PBC. So it might just be worth asking the doctor about it. We do those routinely. Most clinics do. Um, as I say, it doesn't tell you. It's a funny old thing. It, we're not sure why you get it, but it's actually sometimes just a useful test. Well, we've all known something from that. Alison, you got some questions to ask your doctor. And I got to, to relive my antibody in a geek. <laughs> oh, fantastic. So whilst we're on antibodies, um, Dave, I'm going to test your knowledge of Swedish. Um, yeah. We've got somebody who's in Sweden. They've not been tested for AMA, or at least if they have, they don't know about it. Yeah. But they've been tested for ANA HEP2, but they've yeah. also been tested for PML. Now, again, that could be Swedish terminology yeah. and SP100. Yeah. So, again, are they specific for PBC? OK, <clears throat> so different countries have different standard practice for how you detect antibodies. So um, and, and again, you are I, I'm so happy. I've, I've written literally, literally book chapters on this. Right. And, and reviews on this It is my inner. You know, I, 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 if I went on mastermind, this would be my my specialist subject and then nobody will be watching by the end of that because they'd all be bored but it's it you can tell the bottom line is you can tell a phenomenal amount from the antibodies you really can so um essentially in the uk they detect antimitochondrial antibody using tissue slices to stain with the antibody um in some places in the uk and in continental Europe, they use hep, what are called hep G2 cells, which is one of the things that you did there. So that is just an equivalent way of doing it. So it's hep G2 immunofluorescence. It's just one of the tests. So okay. in that will be um, anti-mitochondrial antibody and the PBC-specific anti-nuclear antibody. So it's the equivalent of the way we do it, but it's, it's a, just a different standard technique. So what they've done, putting that together, is that they've found nuclear staining 
um, on the Hep G2 staining, and they've gone on and done a confirmatory test, SP100, which is a different way of doing a test, not widely available in the UK, but is widely available in Europe, um, and it is simply confirms the anti-nuclear antibody. So that is a Swedish or a you know Northern European package for looking at those antibodies, and that is again the PBC specific. Um, anti-nuclear antibody. So it's just a slightly more sophisticated way of, of doing it. Um, the PML is another different type of antibody, which is sometimes seen in PBC. But that is just a, a two, the, the two sides of a coin. That's the other side of the coin for anti-nuclear antibody. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can I just, Alison's, Alison's come back and put a comment. She says, thank you very much. I might get brave and ask my consultant about pattern of stain. Hey. Staining. You should not need any courage to ask your doctor anything about your health. Um, in the old days, that's maybe how it was, not now. It's a joint partnership. No, so, and I think so, it's not yeah. It's not brave. And um, I, I've said on many of these calls that we need to go, we need to, um, we need to develop our inner American. Um, and uh, I've had a number of people from America just phone me up to get advice. I've never met them. They don't know me. Found my phone number. Just asked my advice. I actually referred somebody, um, referred somebody from Brooklyn in New York to Manhattan to get better management for their for their itch. Um, and it was a very nice lady. She phoned me up, and she said, "Are you Dr. Jones?" And I said, "Yes." And she said, "I can you tell me how bad my itch? It's really bad." Um, and I said, because all British people become a bit like Hugh Grant when talking to Americans, I certainly do. So I, I became like Hugh Grant, and I said, I, 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 you're, you're not, you're not from the UK, are you? Um, and she goes, No, I'm from Brooklyn. Can't you tell? Um, <laughs> and she's a very nice lady, and she'd been messed around with her itch. And there's a lady called Nora Bagassa in New York who is a real authority on itch. I know Nora very well. I dropped her a note. I said, this lady's just phoned up and said she's getting the runaround with her itch, and I arranged for it to be seen in New York. And Excellent. But nobody in the UK would do that, and we mm -hmm. should do that a little bit more um, yeah. because, you know, um, and, and good doctors want, want to do that. And I think part of the education that we do is around these really key tests. And I think if everybody knew their alkaline phosphatase and everyone knew their antibody status, then it would be helpful. Just remember, alphos changes, and that, that's a good monitor for how the is going. Um, oh, is that your phone, killer? It's never ever used, and it's... <laughs> so it's your alkaline stopped. phosphatase goes up and down, and that's a good way of monitoring what's going on. The... Um, the um, uh, antibodies don't change. So once you know the story with the antibodies, you don't ever really need those again. So if your antibodies go negative, if you've still got liver, you know, blood test abnormalities, it's still there. So th th you only need to work out the diagnosis once, but, but do ask your doctor. What we're busy doing is telling doctors these are the simple tests. And the first thing I say is the moment you've got anybody with what looks like an immune liver disease with an anti-nuclear antibody, the automatic next question is what's the pattern? Because unless you've got the pattern, you don't know the significance of it. And the, the flip side is sometimes people with autoimmune hepatitis get diagnosed, um, people with PBC get diagnosed as having autoimmune hepatitis um, because they've got an anti-nuclear antibody because ANA is part of autoimmune hepatitis. Um, and then they end up on steroids, and that's no good at all. So it's really important to know. It. But if they have done SP100 and GP210, a small number of, ho ho of ho hotels, hospitals, um, small number of hospitals in the UK do have those tests. So they are the equivalent. So um, just ask your doctor, is it a PBC ANA? And or is it an autoimmune hepatitis ANA? And if they don't know, know the answer, then you know, ask them to, to to refer it on. Immunology labs have a referral pattern. So I go and I go and live my absolute geek fantasy with the lab people um, reasonably frequently. And we, we give them training sessions on how to interpret the antibodies. So they always have a referral system. If they can't make sense of antibodies in a small hospital, they have a pattern to be able to get that. It's an NHS thing. It works very well. Perfect. Thank, Thank you so much. So I feel we've gone from mastermind territory to only connect, but we are, so we're coming off, we're coming out of um, 
um, antibodies at the minute. So I'm aware that we are almost 20 to 3, and we're two questions in. So we are going to go as fast as we can, Dave, so I'm going to help you. Um, so PBC and section, if you're ready. Um, PBC and folic acid, are there any implications? What can you tell us? Um, you can be short on folic acid um, as part of an absorption problem. Um, so any problem with absorption of food, um, you can be short on folic acid. Occasionally, you can be short on for nutritional reasons. Um, so I think it's important to have a normal folate level. Um, it, it's not common, but just put a question mark as to whether there is an absorption problem. So about 5% of PBC patients get celiac disease as part of the spectrum. It's another immune condition, but it can lead you to be to be under absorptive of, of certain vitamins and folic acid is one of them. So yes, supplement it. Um, of course, but just the question mark is, is there a cause for it? And in particular, is it celiac disease? And there are now, again, um, very good antibody tests um, that you can screen for celiac with. So um, and all gastroenterologists are very familiar with that. DTT um, is just a very simple test. Um, so, And if it is celiac disease, it is quite straightforward to manage it, but you do need to. So Sometimes with celiac, you present with weight loss and diarrhea and things like that. But sometimes it's just it's just um, you, you're short on one particular nutrient. So folic acid, it could be that. OK, okay that's helpful. Thank you. I think I've offended some Joel with my Brooklyn accent. <laughs> OK, thank you. For that. So next question. Um, so we're, we're going to um, PVC hair loss. Or so, is it worth trying a different brand? Um, any anything you can say about hair loss, or so, and PBC? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I'm not one to talk about hair loss. I mean, um, uh, it's hardly um, you, something that you, I compromise. You're my, my go-to guy, Dave. Sorry, you were my go-to guy. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, it's commonly reported by people. Um, it's commonly reported by people. And it's one of those things where over the years we've sent lots of people to the dermatologists around it. And they do what dermatologists tend to do, which is to give it a Latin name, which is losing hair and don't really have anything to offer with it. So in our experience, unless it's very patchy hair loss, um, if it's just general thinning of the hair, then it, investigating it doesn't tend to, to offer anything. There's one important thought before you think about Urso, which is a feature of, of low thyroid levels, hypothyroidism. And hypothyroidism, like celiac disease, is associated with PBC. So um, about a third of PBC patients will end up with an underactive thyroid. They really are closely associated. So anybody who puts weight on or loses hair um, uh, with PBC should always have their thyroid function test. We checked. We check it in everybody every year. Um, so that's the first thing. So anytime anybody's got worse hair loss, we check their thyroid function. But also, Assuming David, I, I was going to say, but also um, hormones as well. People, women of a certain yeah. age, um, yes. that can have an effect on hair. Exactly, exactly. So, but there are undoubtedly people who who get thyroid, uh, sorry, who get hair loss starting or so, and, and undoubtedly we've seen people. Um, who start so they get some hair loss, they stop so it stops. So mm -hmm. looking at the drug effect, it, you know, it's it, when it comes when you start the drug and when it goes away when you stop it is usually the usually the giveaway because it's associated twice, if you like. Um, so what we tend to do is do exactly that. So we would try swapping brands. We're not entirely sure why people with Urso lose hair, um, but a lot of drug side effects are to do with what are called the congeners, which is the the other stuff, the capsule, the, the filler in it. Yeah. Um, and then we, we do um, change around. Uh -huh. If it is still going on and it is a problem, then actually that's a reason to think about trying beta-colic acid. So although we often talk about beta-colic acid, OCA, uh -huh. um, we talk about it as a second-line treatment for people who haven't responded enough to Urso. But actually, um, it's also licensed for people who can't tolerate Urso, who are getting Urso side effects. Mm -hmm. So it is possible to try it. Um, and it's about 
five percent of people taking ochre take it because they can't take urso and in our experience they usually can take ochre i don't have much experience of people taking it for because urso is causing hair loss so i couldn't claim mm -hmm. to know whether it would reverse it but we do have that other option now um bees of fibrate um, which is the other agent people use as second line, there is no evidence that you can take that effectively without Urso. So if you're going to try a treatment without Urso, the only one with any evidence is a better cholic acid. And you get, you're looking for a long-term, you're looking for a long-term dosing effect mm -hmm. for people. So it's worth a try. Last thing to say is that we aim for a, a highish dose of Urso at 13 to 15 milligrams per kilogram, but actually some is better than none. And so <laughs> Um, it might be a, a situation in which you go for a lower dose. So a half dose that you take is, mm -hmm. is more effective than a full dose that you can't take. So it, it, yeah. it's also worth noting, David, that we've been uh, we've had this explained to us by a pharmacist that sometimes it is a coating, as you alluded to, on yes. the capsule or the tablet. But to say to people that it's a liquid, a suspension, a liquid yes. crystal. So you could also try that. I'm sure it won't taste very nice, but it's is worth a, a shot, isn't it? Yes, it's interesting. I um, so I don't think I've got that many claims to fame, but the liquid urso is a claim to fame that I have because I persuaded Falk to make it mm -hmm. for people who are struggling with swallowing tablets because of a dry mouth. But in those days, you only had a, a 250 milligram tablet. So people were taking eight tablets and it was a nightmare. Um, mm -hmm. So we persuaded them to make it. And it's very much a niche thing. It's useful for some people, but it is there. And um, uh, as Colette um, alludes to, I have tried it. It is truly disgusting. It, it makes you look forward to taking Questran because it's so much nicer. Um, it tastes as you imagine it would taste. But for people who can't, um, for who are struggling with the tablet form it is there. Now, I hadn't come across the comment about itch. I'm really interested in that. I've not come across that at all. Um, a small number of people itch with Urso, and again, we're not quite sure why. I have never tried the liquid form of Urso in people with itching, but I certainly will after hearing that. And it's these observations which are priceless. Um, we only have a small number of people on it. About one in 20 people with Urso will, will get itch problems. And um, I'll certainly try putting people on a, the, the liquid form because um, if it's as simple as that, it's really easy to do. There are people who swear by it. Um, there are people who swear by it. Um, it's good to have it as an option. And it's good for the kids. With <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I declined by your prof. That's a bit of a shame. It wasn't me, I hope. Um, I think it'd be very. Oh, what was that? I missed that. Um, there's a, a fellow PPC friend found a massive difference. I've asked for the liquid form to try, but have been declined by my prof. Um, that's a real shame. It doesn't cost any, the cost is no different. I mean, oh, well, go back and ask again and ask the reasons no why. He's declining. Uh, so, Urso in all its forms um, is is extremely cheap. Um, it's an extremely cheap therapy, and um, a better cholic acid isn't. It's expensive, but Urso is cheap in all its forms. So I think that's a shame. I'll go back and ask why. All right, thank you. Um, James, uh, Dave, can I ask you how hard is your finish today? I can do till quarter past. I, I'll give you the quarter an hour I messed around. Right. Okay. <laughs> So, so, uh, we'll go through them as quickly as we can then, because we've got more yeah. questions in five minutes. Um, somebody has PBC, they also have restless legs. Yes. They're now starting to have, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, restless arms. So yeah. and they've just almost like having a fit, um, and then it gets heavy and numb, and then they're totally exhausted once it stops. Um, is this linked to PBC, or what questions should they be asking? So the answer, I can answer that completely. It is linked to PVC, and Julia Newton and I wrote the paper on it. Um, so we've actually written that up as a research paper. And um, it is associated with fatigue in PVC, and, and the connection is through sleep disturbance. So restless legs is associated with sleep disturbance, which is associated with fatigue. So those three things go together. And there is a therapy for restless legs, 
Um, and I have completely forgotten its name. I do apologize. Um, That's we can get back to them with that, yeah. Yeah, the standard therapy for restless legs. Um, we wrote up our experience and it, one, works um, for restless legs and sleep, and two, there is a knock-on effect with fatigue if it's there. So I think it's well worth trying. The, the treat, sometimes people struggle to get this treatment because um, it, you know, restless legs, is that, is that a real problem? Well, that was one of the reasons we wrote our experience up. As part of the treatable set of problems PBC patients get associated with fatigue, it, it really is there and it really does respond to simple therapy. So it's one of those things, um, it's not common, but it's well, well, well worth treating it. Um, I don't think there's, there's anything sinister to it. It seems to be part of the neurological kind of process you get, but it's well worth treating it. If somebody can literature search the standard drug and, and throw a name out, I'll tell you if it's the one. I, I just, uh, I've, I've, I am fallible, uh, as we've already discovered with the internet. There's not just PBC, though, is it? Because I know oh, no, 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 no. patients no. who have restless leg syndrome. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, and it's not a it, it's not a fitting thing. It is, a, but it is a sort of um, it's about control. So it's we all get jerk, you know, where you wake up with a myoclonic jerk, you know, wake up like that. It's a it's a variant of that, but it seems to be associated with impair. It seems to be, I mean, to my non expert, um, to my um, non expert, you know, mind, it seems to be a sort of. A, a, a sort of increase in in activation level so it's it's being half awake all the time is part of it and i think that's why it's useful to treat it okay okay perfect thank you and um, so a couple of questions again a is there a commercial name for liquid or so um no it's urso folk certainly the last time i looked at it um, it's Urso Folk suspension is what it yeah. is. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, I don't think any of the generic manufacturers make it. Um, in a hospital, just just worth saying, um, one of the reasons why a, a, a consultant might not prescribe it is because their hospital formulary literally doesn't stock it. So hospitals often have a much narrower range of drugs than a, a, a community, you know, a big boots would do. So that's a, a potential explanation. So the answer there is for the consultant to speak to your GP and for the GP to write a prescription yeah. for it. Yeah. So, um, you know, if a hospital pharmacy hasn't got it, it hasn't got it. Mm -hmm. For us, we're actually in a fortunate position. We, 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 because of where our clinic is physically based, we write external prescriptions. So we don't have any of these problems. We write standard NHS prescriptions for people. So um, mm -hmm. we don't have these problems. So it can prescribe, you know, what we want. Um, okay. um, so but it's it's worth it i don't think any of the generic i don't think the market's very big um i i don't you know but but it's useful to have it so i think it's just an, it needs to be the folk version all right perfect thank you whilst we're on the quick things um in terms of restless legs we've had ropinareal and pramipexol pramipexol is the one we've used Right, okay, I'm with you. All right, perfect. Uh, perfect. Thank you very much. This is a brilliant thing about internet. So we so we did this in, in consultation with our sleep clinic colleagues. Um, so sleep clinics are very good at, at being able to, to mm. look at why it is that people are sleeping poor, poorly. So we have a, a neurologist with interest in sleep, and, and we wrote this with her. So we give Pramiprexol to people, and it works really well. All right, perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, next question. Um, COVID, a couple of COVID-related questions. Um, so somebody had COVID and their liver enzymes went through the roof, but they've started to normalize again. So can we just be reassuring in terms of this is normal procedure um, and wouldn't necessarily affect your PBC? Long yes, time. I think there are many things to yet discover about COVID, but what it does do is tend to mac it sort of switch on cells of the immune system and when those cells die off they tend to die off in the liver so all the evidence that we've got from our, ourselves the italians um you know our colleagues in milan who were hit badly with covid have very good pbc service and from paris is that pbc is not made worse by covid so i think it will be two separate things the key as a hepatologist we see lots of people with 
sudden deterioration of liver function test for a variety of reasons. The important first thing is, if it happened in the context of an acute infection, it's then what you do is just hold your nerve, watch it, mm -hmm. check it settles down, and it usually does. So the, the question is about, um, it's about finding out um, what's left at the end of it. So COVID does weird things to the gut, it does weird things to the liver, but it does not appear to make conditions like PVC worse. Okay, perfect, thank you. If you're due to get your COVID vaccine, should you or should you not take your urso on that day? You're fine to take it. All right, thank you. If the COVID vaccine is working, why are we not out of lockdown? <laughs> We've only done 10 million. We've got a lot more to go. <laughs> um, I That's a, a genuinely a political decision. Um, I think, the as I've said before, so I'll give you my kind of monthly vaccine update. I think it's very useful. So the vaccine program is genuinely going very well. And there have been aspects of the of the COVID response in the UK that have been woeful, and there have been aspects that are very good. So test and trace is woeful. Um, and but the vaccine program has been very good and they and and it is working very effectively. Where I am with the vaccine is that it is quite astonishing how few problems there are with the vaccine. I mean, and I'm you know, I, I'm not a a vaccine person i am a clinician and the guidance we get but quite genuinely um it is it seems over the short term to have no problems at all so i think on that basis i, I would absolutely recommend people to have the vaccine as you know i have had the vaccine my 95 year old mother has had the vaccine i mean you know she complained but she complains about everything she's 95 and is my mother so um so it seems to be very well tolerated all right, perfect. As far as we can understand, the the variants are are more noise than anything else, and I think they are potentially something that we need to get clear in our heads. All viruses evolve, um, particularly RNA viruses. Somebody asked the question: Are all viruses RNA? No, they're not. Um, some are DNA. Hepatitis B is a DNA virus. Hepatitis C is an RNA virus. RNA viruses tend to wander much more, so they will get these changes. But the natural history of these viruses, particularly coronaviruses, is to get milder, not more severe. So I would absolutely not hold off getting the vaccine because of variants. Absolutely wouldn't hold off. If you're offered the vaccine, have it. I suspect we may all end up having an annual vaccine like we do for flu. I don't think that's the end of the world. And I think some of these vaccines are very easily engineerable to be able to be changed every year. So I think that's the direction of travel. Um, I, why are we still in lockdown? I think for me as a member of the public, um, there has been a little bit of mission creep. And I think the reasons why, why we're in hard lockdown seem to evolve over time. And I slightly am concerned about we're doing this to avoid an unknown future risk of an unknown variant of the virus at an unknown time, because I'm not sure how we get out of that. And I think, as a parent of a 16 year old and a 13 year old struggling to do education and all of those things, I'm very aware of the, the impacts of lockdown as well as the potential benefits of it. So uh, I think cases are coming down very rapidly now. I mean, you know, you'll hear different voices, but I can tell you it's getting very quiet again, as it did in the summer. This is very encouraging. It is earlier in the year than we anticipated it might be. We, this tends to be a spring thing. There's a foot of snow outside here, so it's not really spring. So it's happening earlier in the year than we might anticipate. I think a lot of that is vaccination which has been very effective at protecting the, those who might end up going into hospital. At what point do we start to unlock up uh, personally? I think it should be, we should be thinking about getting the schools back as they, as they are doing in Scotland. That's a personal view. It's not official view of my hospital or any of the work that I do with the department of health. I just think that it's a balanced thing and we, we need to start to be looking beyond all of this because vaccination is working very effectively. And I think is it, we've got 10 million of the most high risk. We've got, you know, there's pretty much a seven day rolling average decrease of 25% in numbers of cases. I think some guidance as to what, what we're aiming to, 
to be at is would be a helpful thing for all of us because i just get a sense talking to colleagues and talking to people is the last few weeks people are finding this you know getting to the point where this is really starting to to affect people i i just get that sense from lots of people and i think we all kind of need to see some light at the end of the tunnel that's a personal view Right. Yeah, thank you, David. I just want to go on and say, and I, I feel quite passionate about this. Now, David, every doctor that comes in on Thursday will talk about COVID and vaccines. We have a statement that's up on our website written by a medical advisory. I had three telephone calls last weekend, and I'm happy to take calls, as is Robert. But three very upset people saying to me, or oh, somebody else with PV says that I shouldn't have the vaccine because it's an autoimmune condition, and this and that and the other. So I've asked if that person who's informed of this was a doctor, was a medic, no. Please don't listen to people who don't know what they're talking about. They, if they're not a doctor, do not take it on board. And never mind this, we'll go and look it up. You could look up hundreds of millions of trillions of things that will tell you different things. Come to us, come and talk to us, but please be mindful. And if there's anybody out there who's an anti-vaxxer, that you're entitled to your opinion, but please, please don't upset and frighten other people. That is not fair. Um, I, I have said several times, and I'll say it again, there are two two health interventions that have transformed our world in the last 200 years. One is clean water, the other is vaccination. And yeah. I think it's really important for us to remember that. Yeah. Um, I, We have now vaccinated 10 million people, and I can tell you absolutely there is a dramatically lower level of issues than any of us might have anticipated. So, and you know, in that 10 million, there is an awful lot of people in an age group with autoimmune conditions. So we are seeing no emergent. Now remember this happens. So for example, some of the people will be aware of some of the new cancer drugs that are being used that, that, mm -hmm. that stimulate the immune response to cancers, okay? We are seeing an epidemic of autoimmune hepatitis with those drugs. So we are very familiar with new drugs, new interventions coming along, having a direct knock-on effect in the liver. Mm -hmm. We are a regional center. We're a national center in autoimmune liver disease. People, we hear about these things, we get these people, and I can absolutely tell you, we have not, through COVID, or through vaccination of COVID, had a single person with autoimmune liver disease who has been made worse from the point of view of their autoimmune liver disease by either COVID or the vaccination. COVID in general, and vaccination absolutely, have had, had almost well, literally no impact at all on our population it's very very striking our renal colleagues tell us massive problems with people with you know on dialysis with covid but we are not seeing any burden our wards are empty of people with covid it's really mm -hmm. interesting and i think you're right everyone's entitled to a view um mm -hmm. but there but it, there is no evidence that this vaccine is in any way harmful for people with these conditions absolutely none Thank and I would you. recommend people have the vaccine without hesitation. My wife has done it as a critical care consultant, had it. My mother as a 95-year-old has had it. My sister as a GP has had it. And I, I think it's, and all of us, a bit of a sore arm for a day and that's it. And it's less impactful, absolutely, in, in my experience than a flu jab. Thank right. you, Thank David. You so I'm going to ask you a number of questions about cirrhosis and transplant. Um, but first, can you give us some guidance in terms of the fact that cirrhosis and transplant is very much a journey for the minority of people with PVC? Yes. I'll ask you some questions. Yes. So the vast majority of people presenting with PVC today, this is an irrelevance and will progressively become less and less needed in PVC. And we can already see this. And most people having a transplant for PVC now are people who've had PVC for a long period of time. So that was before the advent even of Urso, let alone more effective treatment. So they will work their way through the system. So um, I, I got, um, uh, I got a, a question from my trust, which is why do I have so few patients as inpatients? And I pointed out to them because every, every aspect of what we do is aimed at preventing anybody ever needing to come into hospital. Ours is an outpatient service, you know, this is, managed as an outpatient and the vision now is to diagnose early treat effectively bring the disease under control and watch it for the rest of your life until something else carries you away that's the vision for the future um but there are people around who who, who were diagnosed at, you know in an earlier era 
there are people who present late and i think that is very important so um probably 70 percent of the people who we end up transplanting for pbc present jaundiced um you know they present with jaundice and ascites and it's just the condition has not been diagnosed so there is some work to do around increasing awareness amongst the gps to not miss it because these people have often had years and years and years and years in which they could have been treated so it is very much a tiny minority of people who need it usually who've had it for a long time from pre pre or so uh, and occasionally a late diagnosis okay perfect so i'm going to come to some questions abby who's in the click meeting room and you just clarify your points because my understanding is that the hospital is referring you for transplant assessment and your GP is saying no. So before I ask Dave, can I just make sure that I've actually understood that um, and then we can answer that in detail. So Dave. So and I think what Abby's meaning is that because she's in the group of underlying health conditions, which I think that's the group I'm in, so we're group six. And I think, if I've got this right, Abby, Abby's in Wales, David, and I think what she's meaning, Ooh, given okay. that she's, she's unwell enough, to warrant a transplant assessment, she, she, should she not be um, looking at having the vaccine now and not yes. waiting till the next tranche? I think that's that's yes. what she means. Yes, yeah. If you're if you're if you be referred for transplant assessment, that is, in, indicates you're there or thereabouts. And good practice is to make sure that you good practice is to make sure that you you know trans get people into the system early so you can have sensible discussions and learn about it. But I mean anybody. Um, uh, certainly, um, you know, anybody um, with a condition where transplant is thought to be necessary, they would be right at the top of the underlying conditions list. But her, her GP is not interested. He's saying no. To the vaccination. To the vaccination. Yeah. I, what you gosh, um, I think speak to the hospital, to be honest. Um, I think speak to the hospital. Um, and um it is slightly complicated by being wales and obviously oh. also because wales doesn't have a transplant center presumably you'll be referred to birmingham oh. um it does depend where you are in that journey but i think um and just to complicate things further birmingham is not currently transplanting people because they're under quite a lot of pressure with covid so we're doing their transplants for them so we are slightly bizarrely the transplant centre for Birmingham. So I think if you've seen been seen at the transplant centre, then they would be good people to talk to. If not, speak to your consultant. And I, I think um, I I think the the um, I, I, it's, it's really difficult. I think in, if if the um, if the hospital thinks you're vulnerable, the GP doesn't. A, if I was the GP, I wouldn't have that argument because you're in danger of losing it. Um, and the other is it's really not helpful for people. So I, my advice is I, um, so, you know, we we haven't fielded any calls like that about our patients, but if it were our patients, those are the sorts of things. Uh, and I think speak to the consultant's secretary and just, or send them an email explaining it. And I think, um, it's the sort of thing where the consultant will normally get involved and, and ask. Yeah, I, I'm just looking at what she said on the screen. I'm actually getting quite annoyed about it because the GP, really, to be fair, is not a PPC expert. I think I know who your consultant is, Abby, but see if he will write a letter or send an email and kick this guy, lady, into touch. I mean, I think, you know, the the... I always train the doc, junior doctors is don't have pointless arguments that you're not going to win. So... You know, in a sense, by having this argument, um, what's going to happen? Well, either you don't get COVID, in which case you're still cross with the BP, or you do get COVID, in which case you've got to go and talk to your solicitor. So why have that argument? I mean, why? Mm. It doesn't, it makes no sense. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So I would so involve them. I mean, that's the sort of thing that we do get involved in with these things, and they mysteriously tend to go away. I found that having an OBE actually strangely helps with that. So... Um, I, mean, I don't usually use the, the, the OBE, but I do when I'm encouraging people to do things. I think it makes people think I know something. Yeah, she's saying thanks. The liver staff has offered to intervene. Let them do it, Abby. Get them, get them on your Absolutely. side. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so coming to more um, uh, questions about cirrhosis and, and transplant. If you've got other autoimmune conditions, will that um, exclude you from liver transplant? Absolutely not. 
Okay. Um, and it, it's an interesting observation that I have never encountered a PBC patient at a liver transplant who had problems with other autoimmune conditions after transplant. It seems like immunosuppression just wraps it all up. So dry eyes and dry mouth, for example, is not directly the liver. It's part of, you know, inflammation and salivary glands, but it always gets better after transplant in my experience. I mean, there may be exceptions to that. So absolutely not. Uh, people do very well with it. Excellent. Right, thank you. How do you detect cirrhosis? So that's a really good question. Um, and so the answer is there there are several ways in practice the one we don't is by biopsy so we would never do a biopsy to look for cirrhosis not ever um although clearly if you have a biopsy you know because you want to look at treatment options um and you find cirrhosis then it, it it's useful information so the, the ways you do it are one if you have a complication of cirrhosis such as varices that by definition gives you a diagnosis of, of cirrhosis. So if you had a variceal bleed or found to have varices on endoscopy, that would equal the diagnosis, but most people don't. The second, most commonly, we use a technique called fibro scan nowadays, which is a version of ultrasound, which is like sonar. It sends a sonar signal that bounces back off the liver. And it's a really neat test um, because the, the heart, the sort of stiffer the liver is, the more signal returns. So you can measure that. So that is basically in our practice completely replaced biopsy. So we have our own scanner. We do it in the clinic. So we do it in real time. People will come and see us and they'll whiz down the corridor, have a fiber scan. Um, and it's really helpful. So that's the, the usual way. And the cutoffs for that are very well described. So most places will do a fibro scan. Now they won't do it every year because if you've got really early disease, you know, there's no point in repeating it every year because, you know, it, it, it only slowly progresses. But if it is elevated, we keep a check on people like that. So that's a really good test for it. And then the final one that everyone can look out for is one of your blood tests called your platelet count. The platelets are the tiny cells in the blood that help the blood clot. And the number falls when you've got cirrhosis um, because um, they, they tend to end up sitting in the spleen. So the magic number is 150. Um, and if your platelet count is under 150, that's usually a, a sign of cirrhosis. So we tend to watch all of those things. So we look at the fibro scans, we, we scan the platelet count. But if you hit any of those, then we would treat somebody as having cirrhosis. What that means in practice is what we would do some enhanced screening for complications. So we would recommend an endoscopy. We would recommend a couple of extra blood tests and an ultrasound scan every year. And so that's that's the only material change. Whether you go for transplant assessment is not actually to do with having cirrhosis or not. It's all down to blood tests. And there are plenty of people plenty of people who have cirrhosis for 20 plus years and with pbc and never have any problems and i always remember a lovely guy who was the father of a gp friend of mine and he is the only person i've ever had a complication with a liver biopsy with only one um and for 20 years he came to the clinic and reminded me about his his he had a, a small leak um mm -hmm. and in all those 20 years he still had cirrhosis and he had completely normal liver function tests and never had any complications and eventually died of old age. We all lived happily ever after. <laughs> 20 years ago, reminded me. I'm aware of time, Dave. We've got oh, I'm okay until half past if people want to. Bless you. Thank you. Um, somebody's been told they've got ascites, but they've not been told anything else. So, again, what, what do they need to know? What questions should they be asking? Okay, so so the first thing to say is ascites is pretty uncommon in PBC. So ascites is where you get fluid in the tummy, um, and it's pretty uncommon in PBC. Um, it, it, even in people, you know, who are coming up towards transplantation. So, so cirrhosis in PBC is very different to cirrhosis in other types of liver disease. It behaves in a very different way. So it's pretty uncommon. Um, 
the first question therefore is is it really a CITES and um, it can sometimes be difficult to distinguish it from you know tummy when there's a small amount so the first thing to say is unless it's really clear cut we would always do an ultrasound scan and find out if there is any ascites. So ultrasound is the best way to find whether it's there or not. So we would always kind of ask that question. And that would also be done to have a little look at the liver because you want to have a look at the consistency of the liver to see if it, if it you know, if it's big or it's small or whatever. So I think an ultrasound scan, if you've not had one, is the right first thing to do, okay? Yeah. The next question is, um, is it there for PB? If it is ascites, is it there for PBC? Because there are other conditions that can give you ascites. So heart disease can, um, other forms of liver disease obviously can, and some tumors can. So it's really quite important if it's if it's if it's ascites just to be sure it's the PBC. And that's one of the reasons you do the ultrasound scan. So you just want to ask that question. After that. The question is, is it causing you a problem? So just having ascites may not cause a problem. The problems you might get are it might be quite tense and make it uncomfortable um, or difficult to breathe, in which case treating it is the right thing to do. Um, and you would normally treat in the first instance with water tablets, which which just you know, reduce the amount of fluid. And that's usually all you ever need to do in, in PBC, although there are some things you can do if it is problematic. If it is PB, so if, 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 if it's ascites, and if it's really PBC that's causing the ascites, then, you know, that's something to take on board. So that instantly for us would put you into a category where we'd want to, to watch you much more closely and just check if there is a pattern of this getting worse. So it's certainly the sort of thing, and I would certainly want to know you know, we, we we manage most of the people in the north of Eng, of the north of England, but not all of them. People with very mild disease are often looked after by other consultants. But we would absolutely want to see um, anybody with ascites with PBC absolutely in our clinic. Why? Because I'm not. It's very difficult to predict what's going to happen over the next year, two years, five years, and we would want to to be ahead of the curve with that. So, if you're not being seen in a centre that understands PBC, it's probably time to. And the Brit British treatment guidelines would say that it's it's when you get a complication, that's the time to be seen in a specialist centre. Doesn't mean you need a transplant, but it means that that we need to be thinking about all of the options. But there are several ifs in that. And it is important. What I would say is a lot of the clinical diagnosis where a GP or somebody says you've got ascites tend out tend not to be, I have to say. So unless you've got an ultrasound scan shown by somebody who know done by somebody who knows look, how to look for ascites, um, because there is a tendency in some doctors to kind of link ascites and liver disease together, and they miss the point that it's very, very uncommon in PBC. It's within liver disease, they behave very, very differently. So PBC is one where ascites is, is, is pretty uncommon. Perfect, thank you. Um, Chief, were you going to say anything there? No, no, I was just uh, absorbing. Just to any, say. any link between PBC and any heart conditions? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, so it's a, it's a question that goes, um, uh, there's a question, it's a question that goes round and round and round and round and round. And so the answer is, in terms of heart disease, as we would understand it, ischemic heart disease. So, you know, heart attack, heart disease, there does not appear to be any connection at all. Um, and that's been looked at by quite a lot of people over the years. Um, and, um, and the reason people tend to look at it is because cholesterol is often elevated in PBC and people put two and two together, but they put two and two together and made five because the cholesterol increase in PBC is not the one that causes heart problems typically. Okay. Having said that, PBC is not protective of heart disease either. It's just neutral. So clearly, you know, PB, people with PBC are at risk of heart disease like anybody else is. And one of the little secrets in PBC is that people are more likely to smoke with PBC than age and sex match controls. Just remember that. So smoking might be a factor. So all things being equal, it is not um, particularly associated at all. And the cholesterol is a bit of a red herring. Um, 
it gets a little bit more complicated in the sense that we've done some work doing quite complex scanning of people's hearts and what sometimes can happen with pbc particularly in people who've got fatigue is that the heart can be a little bit odd in how it works now when your heart beats we all think of our heart beating like that but it doesn't um the ventricle which which is the pumping chamber it doesn't do that it does that like it's right ringing a dishcloth so it's it rotates and what people with pbc sometimes get is that rotation isn't as effective so the heart looks normal but it it doesn't squeeze quite as well and that seems to be associated with fatigue in in some people so we're very interested in why that arises but what it does mean is that sometimes people cannot be quite as effective at their heart pumping and so they can sometimes get a little bit short of breath with it so it's not heart failure as people understand it the heart you know empties normally but it's just not as effective so it actually is something where people if people have got symptoms of shortness of breath difficulty with walking then actually it's worth a cardiac review not because it's ischemic heart disease you know heart attack time heart disease oh. or conventional heart failure it can just be part of a functional thing and an, an image they nowadays what we did as a research tool 10 years ago is now routine in the nhs um so an mri scan of the heart is often quite a little a useful thing just to look at whether that function thing is there perfect thank you very much um next question is actually it's in the room so john is saying that he was diagnosed last year positive ama liver function normal bouts of chronic fatigue Lately localized itching, right leg calf, usually when in bed, scratching makes it worse. Is this normal? So can you talk a little just about itch? Yes. So um, itch in PBC is has several characteristics. So um, it's very different to an allergy itch. And again, this is where people often make a mistake. So, so what's a skin itch will often be associated with obviously visible skin changes um, and it will often feel like it's on the surface of the skin pbc itch is deep under the skin um, often feels like creepy crawlies people often say it's like a painful itch it's so itchy it's painful it's interesting it's not quite itch it's almost a, an odd form of pain and of course it doesn't have any rash although people can scratch in response to it and sort of cause skin changes so it it is in its characteristics quite different and I, one of the things that you know students who sit in the clinic with me are always fascinated by is that we spend you know 10 minutes talking about the characteristics of itch and they just thought itch was itch it also affects odd parts of the body so it affects um it, it can affect the scalp it can affect the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet it can affect the back but it can also affect little patches so all of that would fit with it now one of the questions we always get asked is but with people with abnormal with an ama but with normal liver function now assuming you don't mean normal liver function on ursa in which case it's a different thing you know if somebody's got ama positivity and has never had abnormal lfts could it be pbc symptoms and the answer is again we've researched this and there are undoubtedly people who have the PBC antibody who have PBC symptoms. So we definitely see people with PBC itch whose liver function is normal, but they are AMA positive. And what we use, and normally you've got to have two out of those three characteristics, remember? But to, we add a fourth one, which is anybody with characteristic PBC symptoms who is AMA positive, we would treat as PBC because actually the best way to treat the symptoms is to get on top of the disease so it isn't common you know don't get me wrong but we treat ama positivity with symptoms as equaling pbc and start people on uh, so and so the important thing with itch with pbch the main thing is not to focus on um, antihistamines so again gps will tend to use antihistamines chlorpheniramine you know pyroton things like that those don't particularly work for pbc itch and also they can sedate even non-sedating antihistamines sedate in pbc and so they can make people feel really quite rotten so there are much better 
approaches to treatment. So we would use a PBC type of itch treatment. Perfect. And, and you know, go to the chemist and get a big bag of bicarbonate soda, put it in the bath, and have uh, a bicarb bath before you go to bed, and you'll find that yeah, that yeah. can help so, as well. So skin-based things are yeah. are good. Um, a lot of people swear by vitamin E cream, um, so um, that can work um, better perhaps than just E forty five. Um, steroid creams, absolutely no, they cause more problems than they solve, but. Um, uh, but keep the skin nice and and dry. And actually, um, that there used to be certainly available um, a vitamin E oil that people could add into the bath. And again, a lot of people swore by that. Holland and Barrett, you know, other retailers are available. <laughs> and used to be quite good for these things. And I've not spoken to anybody recently about it whether they still stop them. But vitamin E based skin products are all um, useful for people. Mm -hmm. Okay. What I would say about itch is, and Colette and Robert know this, is that because they're helping out with the specking of these things, is there are some really, really exciting new therapies coming along for itch, really exciting ones, um, yeah. which are completely different. One of the dangers with new drug development is that you, you end up doing the same old, same old. They're variations of a theme. Oh. Okay. And what you need, so there are some that really basically switch off transmission of the itch sensation. So... I think I, I think it's going to be you know one of the really big areas for new therapies over the next few years. Yeah. So watch this space. Absolutely. Perfect. So on that subject, somebody has asked: Is it necessary for them to take the Questran? <laughs> <laughs> I, I presume they take it. If, if you're itching, you would want yeah, to. Yeah, you know. Yeah. The thing about itch is that it is. It is what it is, which is a nuisance symptom that can be can be everything from something that people mention. Now you come to ask me about it to something that is life alteringly bad. Um, but what it doesn't do is is cause is cause risk to you. So it is what it is, which is a symptom, which is a problem to a greater or lesser extent. So in a sense, the reason for treating it is purely about controlling the symptom. It has no other significance. So nobody needs treatment for itch other than to control an unpleasant symptom. So in a sense, that's a personal decision. A lot of people with itch have itch because, and, and this is a trap drug companies fall into again and again and again and again, is a lot of trials report itch as a problem, but it isn't. It's just itch that... PBC patients get so a lot of people have itch but don't want treatment for it but you know they are reassured to know that it's part of the disease but actually you know when I'm focusing on something else I forget about it and actually it's nice to know there's a treatment but it's nowhere near bad enough and yeah. a lot of people don't understand that just having a symptom doesn't mean you want to treat it but you should always know that there are treatments that are available and you can trigger that at any point. Yeah. So a lot of people, um, a lot of people, by knowing there are options, elect not to take those options. It's about what well, a thing I call owning the problem, and yeah. owning the solution. So if the itch isn't bad, don't take the Questran. Um, Questran can be taken like a paracetamol. Take it when it's bad. Stop taking it when it isn't bad. It's not like an antibiotic that needs a course taken mm -hmm. continuously. And so a lot of people use Questran intermittently. So if the answer is, if the itch isn't bad, then, you know, you don't need the Questran and you can save it to take another time. The only thing I would say is that that once you get into the, the deeper and, and honestly, the second of my geek fest things after after antibodies is itch treatment. So you're getting the double whammy today. Um, when you get into more complicated treatments like rifampicin, which people on the call might be on that's a little bit different rifampicin works well taken as a preventative thing and actually it's one of the things where people stop taking it it sometimes doesn't work as well if you start it again so questran i would use it absolutely intermittently if you if you if you need to take it every day take it every day if you don't take it whenever you need to take it for a few days at a time but if you move on to rifampicin i would keep taking that because sometimes the first time it works is the best effect you get with it so that's just a tip from my experience wonderful thank you so much right so i've got one last question which i'm going to ask you before i say that there are a couple of questions we've not had time to come through but what i would encourage you to do so if you're asking about 
Um, symptom management, so for example, if your fatigue is up, um, any of those kind of things, please do come to the foundation directly. We can help you on the helpline. We use a telephone. We also use data services such as this technology for face-to-face -face or for translating. But we can use Skype, FaceTime, WhatsApp, and all of those things yeah. as well. And so just please, one thing just to say is that COVID has been a horrible, horrible, horrible thing for everybody. Um, however, we have learned some things about how to practice medicine, including these sessions, um, which we're now agreed are going to become a permanent thing. We've learned something about how to, to look after people, and we've realized that managing at a distance works really well. And, of course, one area where managing at a distance would work really well is with symptoms because it, it's all about the description of it that matters, that it's not a – you can't examine somebody for itch or fatigue. And it's not particularly blood tests. And actually, it's all done by questionnaires and things. And one of the things that we are looking at is, is setting up a specific PBC symptoms clinic, but doing it virtually um, and potentially, therefore, seeing people from all over the country. Um, because and, and we are just looking now is not the time because of COVID pressures, but that is a direction of travel just to set up a dedicated symptom management mm -hmm. clinic. Um, yeah, that's so fantastic. If, yeah. if people feel that's a useful thing, just feed that back to Colette and Robert, who obviously absolutely also, you know, provide the support and the advice and the guidance. But collectively, just a different way of doing it, you know, rather than and rather than a clinic that focuses on blood tests and things, something that focuses on symptoms and living with it. So it's just something we're toying with. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So I know that we've overrun by a huge amount. So I'm going to ask one more question and I'm going to hang over to the chief. So again, thank you so much, Dave. My question is, so we talked earlier about people having additional autoimmune diseases and, you know, will that affect their, their chances of transplant and that kind of thing. But if people are getting other autoimmune conditions, does that, is it a complication or a consequence of their PBC? Does it mean their PBC is getting worse? Does it mean that the liver disease within their, the actual cell change within their liver is getting worse? No, it's a shared origin thing. So it's because one of the reasons why you get PBC is because your immune system is built in a certain way. So it overreacts to certain things. And basically, that's if, if that's your immune system affecting the liver, it's all about how it's built up there. So that common origin can also predispose to other conditions. So it's it's about a risk factor. So the things that make you at risk of having PBC also make you at risk of having those other conditions. Now, none of none of those conditions is a contraindication at all to transplant and none of them directly impacts on the PBC at all. Um, so they are a, a greater or lesser nuisance and we manage those often. We, we try and avoid as much as possible people going to endless different clinics. Um, sometimes we co-manage with the rheumatologists around joint problems and things that works very well. One thing that we do do is try and make sure that the treatment works for everything. So there are PBC therapies or rheumatoid arthritis therapies, so particularly rheumatoid arthritis therapies, um, where there are some that also work for PBC and some that don't work for PBC. Yeah. Well, if they're thinking of using a particular treatment, why not use one that works for PBC as well? So there is a dialogue. So, so the dialogue is very active and ongoing with our colleagues about treatment choices so that you see the whole of the disease spectrum rather than just one condition. So we guide them into using drugs that work for PBC rather than drugs that don't work for PBC. Although no drug that I've ever come across used for any autoimmune condition other than, you know, makes PBC worse. It's all about killing two birds with one stone if you can. So um, mm -hmm. encourage if you are being seen in more than one clinic, and sometimes it's in more than one hospital, just encourage them to talk to each other because yeah. it does make management work a lot better. One mm -hmm. of the things I've learned from experience is that non-liver doctors often worry about livers, okay? They worry about using drugs, they worry about mm -hmm. doing it wrong, it's a bit of a scary thing. It's not at all, actually, um, but I can say that, you know, having done it for all these years. So sometimes people can hold their punches, um, can, can pull their punches about treating other conditions because mm -hmm. they're worried about the liver. And the answer is with PBC is 99 times out of 100, no, 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 no. 
you know, we will ride and manage any PBC issues. It's yeah. sometimes a thing with autoimmune conditions. It's also sometimes a thing with cancer. I've come across somebody and they didn't want to treat early breast cancer because somebody had stage one PBC. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. Talk to us, treat the cancer, we will manage the liver. And so yeah. that's one of the reasons we, we always follow people up, just to remind them that we're here and, and don't pull punches. If you need a treatment for another condition, short of being on a transplant list when you might have to you know, take yeah. care, it's safe to have other treatments, but do talk and have a dialogue. Excellent. No, that's absolutely fantastic advice. Of course, up here in Scotland, all our computers talk to each other. They don't down there, do they? It's one of the few things we've got right. Anyway, I digress. Now, David, thank you so, so much. And thank you for staying with us and over running. Robert, as always, I just want to say, David alluded to it earlier. For those of you who are not members, um, please come and go onto our website and join. Become a member. And when you do that, download our app because we've got very exciting stuff coming up. We've got a couple of questionnaires, I think it's two. Uh, we've got pharma and internal, and this is really, really massive in terms of the etching treatments, as David was saying. So yeah. they are being prepared, they're drafted at the moment, we'll get back to you, but please download our app. And if those of you that are in who are members, and you haven't, please do so. And if, you, if you're stuck, uh, phone at the office. Can I just please. echo that, tracking? Yeah. Tracking is going to be critical, particularly as you get into symptomatic measurements. And there's a there's a there's a movement in clinical trials, which is around real world data. So the problem with trials is they're quite artificial. Whereas and so something like itch, where thinking about itch makes itch worse, you, you get that problem. Whereas real world data capture, they're realistic trial designs. It's kind of naturalistic. There's a science called ethnography, which is about watching people and watching situations without without your watching interfering with them um, and we need to take that approach so the data capture is is therefore very very valuable Absolutely. and i think it's going to be increasingly built into trials the other thing about being part of the foundation is there is no bit of information about something emerging in pbc or no opportunity or nothing new that you will not hear about first through the pbc foundation mm -hmm. literature and website so it yeah. is cutting edge and uh, we all, you know, very, very, very much value our time spent, you know, with the foundation and do things like this session gladly. It's yeah. incredibly enjoyable, but they're very, very valuable. But we also write the articles for the bare facts and things myself. Yeah, absolutely. And no, and it's, they are bang up to date, more up to date than any textbook you'll ever read because it, the, the, the turnaround time is so quick. And we've been able to do that with covid so you will not find anywhere in the world better guidance things like covid accessible for patients than you will do with the foundation because it's quickest and basically you know they they have us on tap and, and <laughs> well, you know, absolutely. we couldn't do it without you i mean you and james and george have been, and and andy yeoman be absolutely fantastic and you know you really do us a, a brilliant service so i'm going to say to everybody Join the foundation, download the app, watch out for the surveys, they're being prepared. And also, um, thank you for joining us. And I'm going to say one last thing. If you can, please go to our website and donate. These things cost us money. There's a recession out there. We're finding it tough. We get no government funding whatsoever. Nobody wants to fund us. Um, we're not that important. And we work hard internally. And I know you always help where you can. But if a price of a cup of coffee or a price of a bungalow. I don't mind. I'll accept both. Or it's somewhere it's something in between. But um, please do think about us. So, um, gentlemen, thank just, you. Can I just uh, just yes. I'm going to ask because I don't. I think this will blow people away. Is Robert? What is the current through all the activities that, that you have done through COVID, through all of the outreach stuff that you've done? What's the total number of people who've contacted or engaged with it now? What's it running at? <laughs> we lost count at about three hundred thousand. Yeah. Okay, so three hundred thousand, but that was months ago. Yeah, and it's probably near a million by now. And you know, just these these question and answer sessions. Last time you gave me the number, twenty four and a half thousand people have accessed them. Oh. And I think the scale of this and the spirit behind it, and and I think you know we. We are incredibly impressed by the efforts of the foundation in doing all of this. Uh, and I have badgered the Department of Health about doing more to support the charities doing this work, which is not available on the NHS. This is 
pure NHS people, but th right. this is the NHS is not slick enough to do this sort of thing. But I just think this exercise and the reach it's had and the influence and the reassurance and the just the sense of community with it has been one of the truly positive bits out of COVID. I think it is extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. And to your credit. Yeah. Well, thank you so, so much for that. So I'm going to let you all go. David, you, this is way into your afternoon now. Is that you finished for the day or have you got lots to oh, do? Oh, Lord, no. Oh, bless. No. <laughs> Robert, thank got, you. I'm, I'm, I'm seven back. minutes late for my next call and I need to prepare for it, but there you go. <laughs> Robert's but you give it to me antibody bitch, so I'm happy, you know? You're happy. Robert's back online in 23 minutes, I think. Um, I'm going to say goodbye to the many, many thanks, and I'll see you all soon. All right, take care of. Okay. Bye-bye now.